Good afternoon. Welcome to this EFI Foundation event to release our new Factbook for Hydrogen Hub Stakeholders titled Environmental Justice Views on Hydrogen. My name is Madeline Schomburg. I am the Director of Research here. And for those of you who may not be familiar with us, the EFI Foundation continues the work of the Energy Futures Initiative to advance technically grounded solutions for the clean energy transition through evidence-based analysis, thought leadership, and coalition building. We published our new factbook today, and it is available on our website at efifoundation.org. Before we continue, two quick announcements. First, this event is being recorded and will be available afterward on our YouTube channel. Second, we're going to save the latter portion of the hour for an audience Q&A. So if you have a question, please do submit it through Zoom's chat feature at any time during the event, and we will try to get through as many of those as possible. And now to kick things off, I would like to hand it over to EFI Foundation CEO and the 13th Secretary of Energy, Dr. Ernest Moniz. Well, thank you, uh, Madeline, and uh, thanks especially to uh, all of you who have uh, uh, tuned in uh, to um, to this uh, to this podcast. Um, uh, I also want to add thanks, of course, right right uh, right up top to uh, Breakthrough Energy, uh, who has uh, sponsored this work and has consistently been engaged uh, in, uh, in 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 community issues. So uh, it's a great uh, it's great partnership. Um, today, as Madeline said, uh, we'll be presenting uh, the uh, EFI Foundation's uh, fact book, uh, highlighting uh, perspectives on environmental justice organizations of environmental justice organizations on hydrogen and the community benefits plan process within the regional clean hydrogen hubs program. Uh, the DOE, the uh, Department of Energy, launched uh, the hydrogen hubs program uh, with eight billion dollars uh, from the uh, infrastructure uh, law. Uh, to create this, uh, hopefully to create a national uh, clean hydrogen market. Um, uh, of course, uh, this move towards growing the hydrogen economy uh, has not generated completely uh, monolithic uh, responses, uh, and uh, uh, particularly in, in, in terms of the, uh, the clean energy pathway uh, in EJ communities. And so that will be the, the focus of our, of our discussion today. Uh, we wanted to bring uh, uh, all voices uh, into this conversation, uh, and uh, community engagement uh, has been uh, a central part of the Hydrogen Hubs program construct. And frankly, I'd like to thank the administration in particular uh, for bringing this community focus uh, into so many of the clean energy uh, programs. So um, to continue our work in terms of uh, community engagement, uh, this fact book builds on some earlier uh, research that was released in February, uh, building stronger community engagement in hydrogen hubs. Uh, as part of that initial research, uh, one aspect of our national survey found predominantly favorable views from EJ members on hydrogen's potential. Uh, but these results often differed from EJ organizations uh, who had uh, who often took a more critical, uh, uh, public positions. And so to understand this uh, divergence, uh, we conducted this follow-up uh, survey with EJ organizations that signed public-facing letters related to hydrogen energy. The fact book data that we will present today uh, were gathered uh, through these two surveys, again, one targeting uh, uh, members of EJ communities and a follow-up survey focusing solely on EJ organizations. Uh, we'll also present an analysis of the public letters of EJ organizations' perspectives uh, on hydrogen. I think this research opens up an opportunity to gain a balanced understanding of community views and EJ or, or organizational uh, concerns. What we really hope is that uh, the results of, of our work will be valuable for the communities, for the organizations, for policymakers, uh, and for uh, other stakeholders uh, in this uh, in this process. Uh, as our uh, EFIF uh, knowledge in this space continues to evolve, uh, this fact book aims to highlight the important insights from EJ communities to accomplish effective community engagement. So uh, with that, I'm go uh, we're going to turn it, turn it back to Madeline to start the discussion, but uh, in doing so, let me first uh, uh, add thanks to the EFI, EFI Foundation 
a team that did the work and organized uh, organized the event. Um, also, thanks to the uh, internal and external reviewers uh, who offered uh, their time and invaluable perspectives and helped shape this fact book as a useful uh, resource. So, um, Madeline, I think we'll uh, thank and acknowledge the, the panel members explicitly, so I'll leave that to her. I'll just say that Madeline uh, uh, has focused for a long time on energy justice uh, questions, uh, examining uh, access and inclusion in policy processes uh, and decision making. And uh, as she noted, she is the research director here at the EFI Foundation and led this project. Madeline, back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Moniz. Allow me a moment to pull my slides up. Okay. I'd like to start by echoing what Dr. Moniz said, thanking the project team led by Alex Kaiser and with tremendous efforts from Beth Dowdy, Ben Bayama, and Karina Faro. So thank you to them for all their work. As Dr. Moniz indicated, this work really is building on what you saw released in February, a fact book that really tried to highlight community perspectives across the country. It included a broader array of community types, including environmental justice members, those who self-identified as being part of an environmental justice group, but also including disadvantaged community members, tribal communities, and labor communities. And as uh, Dr. Moniz indicated, what we saw there was a little bit surprising to be blunt, that there was a high degree of support for hydrogen, which didn't quite match the public rhetoric that we had seen. And so we decided that we really needed to dig into this further to try to understand why that discrepancy existed. So first, focusing for a moment on the letters that we're referring to, when we talk about public rhetoric, there were over 140 environmental justice organizations that signed on to letters talking about hydrogen. And the letters were, I would characterize as negative, let's just say, about the role of hydrogen in helping to address climate change. You can see from this graph here, some of the sort of specific components that we identified in the letters. And what the colors are indicating to you are the production pathways that were referred to in the letters. So that light blue bar there, those are where the letters were specifically talking about blue hydrogen or hydrogen that is produced through steam methane reforming with carbon capture and sequestration. So removing the carbon that way. The dark blue are letters that did not refer to any specific type of hydrogen, but just categorized hydrogen broadly. And then the light green are letters that specifically were talking about green hydrogen or hydrogen produced through electrolysis with renewable electricity. So you can see that in particular, people had a lot of concerns in those letters about the potential for blue hydrogen to prolong our dependence on fossil fuel, to require new pipelines, and to create local air pollution issues. We don't see a lot of those letters referring to the potential positives of hydrogen unless they're referring specifically to green hydrogen. And then we did see a bit more um, sort of emphasis on the potential positives, like the potential to address climate change, to help perhaps solve some local air pollution problems and to create new jobs. But by and large, the message was that of an anti-hydrogen stance. And so that's what really prompted this phase of the research to try to dig into that more. So to do that, we sent a follow-up survey to all of those organizations that signed on to these letters. So all of the respondents who we are highlighting in this fact book are signatories of the letters that we are referring to here. And what we found in that follow-up survey was that a lot of those groups, 70%, did say that they support the use of hydrogen if it is green hydrogen. There were a couple of groups who also supported other forms of hydrogen production, but all of those also indicated support for green hydrogen. So that 70% captures those others as well. And the other 30% were opposed to hydrogen regardless of the production pathway that was utilized. So we refer to this survey and these results as EJ groups, and you'll note that in the heading here on the right. And then what you're seeing on the left, EJ members, that's from that first survey, that broad public survey that we did that was released back in February. And so of that survey, we found that 83% of the EJ members said that they supported hydrogen. 
So these numbers to me are not actually all that different. It's still a majority we're expressing support. It's just drawing more of a fine line that that support is contingent on production pathway and it's not necessarily to be interpreted as broad support. So when we drilled down a little bit further, what we found was that EJ groups that support green hydrogen tend to be more focused on the potential benefits than EJ groups that don't support hydrogen at all, but they tend to share the same concerns. So what we're taking from this is it's not the lack of concern that's really driving support or opposition, but really how you feel about the potential benefits. And you can see that in these graphs, if you look at the top half, the top half is really focused on some of those potential negative impacts. And you'll notice that the vast majority of both EJ groups opposed to hydrogen and EJ groups who support green hydrogen are concerned that it could prolong our dependence on fossil fuels, it could cause explosions, it could create local air pollution issues, and pretty agreed about half of them in terms of requiring new pipelines. But if you look at the bottom half, we see a really interesting distinction where those EJ groups who do support green hydrogen tend to also think that it's going to help create some new jobs and perhaps address some of those local air pollution problems. And a small you know, 10% do think it could help address climate change. Whereas the EJ groups who are completely opposed to hydrogen are much more likely to say it will not help address climate change, it will not help solve local air pollution, and maybe it will help with creating some new jobs. So when we asked the EJ groups, okay, why do you think these differences exist? What explains the discrepancy that we saw in our survey versus in the letters? What we found was that most groups attributed the difference to varying degrees of familiarity or knowledge about hydrogen and the prevalence of misinformation. So we've pulled out some illustrative quotes here to give you a sense of the responses that we got. Um, and you can see things like, Letters written by folks with deeper expertise, survey folks may not be as aware of the issues. Or one over here about misinformation that says, we are very concerned about hydrogen misinformation targeting our communities that is funded by the government and stakeholder industries. So it seems that this education component, if you will, is important. Um, to a lot of stakeholders in terms of what they see as the main hurdle to helping people um, understand the issues. Then when we asked EJ organizations about the community engagement tactics that they would like to see hydrogen hub developers utilize, we found a pretty high degree of overlap in the top three with the EJ members perspective, such that public hearings and citizen panels are both in the top three for the EJ members, remember those are the general public members who responded to our first survey, identifying as part of EJ group, and the EJ organizations themselves. The one notable difference you'll see right there on the far left side is that the number one preferred choice for EJ organizations was working groups, which was, I believe, number seven for the EJ members ranking. And working groups we defined as a group of community members who come together regularly to discuss the project. So we could speculate, but we don't have real data on why that method is so much more strongly preferred by EJ organizations. So perhaps that's something for us to investigate later. Um, and finally, we found that EJ groups who have already engaged with the hydrogen hub are pessimistic about the benefits of the community benefits planning process or CBP process, which is the method that the Department of Energy is utilizing right now to facilitate community engagement for the hydrogen hub. And what you can see on this graph here is on the left-hand side, about half of our respondents agreed that using this community benefits planning process would bring their communities into the conversation more with the hub. However, what you see from the subsequent three components there is they did not believe that the CBP process was going to really benefit their communities, would change the decision-making or how much influence their communities have over decision-making in the process, or create a more fair process for their communities. 
So it seems as though the CBP process may be effectively including more people in the conversation, but perhaps there's another step that needs to be done to take that inclusion and turn it into some real tangible outcomes or actions that have the benefits that we are trying to achieve through the CBP process. And I'd like to end with a brief preview of some of the ongoing work that we're doing to build on this research. So we wanted this next phase of the project to really be community-led. And to do that, we fielded another survey of community members living in the 16 states that are part of the hub-selected region to ask them, if you had access to a group of researchers right now, what do you most want to know? And how do you need to be supported to engage? What tangible and intangible things do you need? And the number one uh, component that emerged in terms of the research was community members really wanted to know how do they develop a binding agreement. So we have been doing a case study analysis to try to answer just that. We've been interviewing dozens of stakeholders from across the country that span a range of different types of binding agreements that have, some of which have been in place for decades, some of which are pretty new, to try to understand how do you go from zero to a binding agreement. So we're leaving aside for a moment the questions of what's in it and the implementation, but trying to really inform where the hubs are right now with trying to develop those agreements and focusing in on the processes. And we're very excited to be able to share that in the next couple of months. Um, we're also gonna hopefully share some of the results of this, this survey that is out now, um, asking about how people want to be brought into those conversations, how often they want to be contacted, where they want to be reached, and some of the sort of tactical details that can really help um, to meet communities where they're at. And all of this is building into our toolkit that we will have on our website um, in the next few months. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to our panel. So I'm going to stop sharing. And uh, we are very honored to have a last minute addition to our panel. We have Dr. Ruhan Nagra joining us. She is an associate professor of law and the founding director of the Environmental Justice Clinic at the University of Utah. We have Eleanor Smith, who is a community organizer for Tanajoni Ani. And we have Dr. Stephanie Malin, who is the co-director of the Center for Environmental Justice and an associate professor at Colorado State University and our very own Beth Dowdy, who is a research associate here at the EFI Foundation, as well as a doctoral student at American University. And we will be moderated by Marcel Akame, who is an associate in the U.S. Policy and Advocacy team at Breakthrough Energy. Thank you all so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Madeline. Um, yeah, hi everyone. My name is Marcel Akame. I'm an associate at Breakthrough Energy, um, and I co-lead our engagement around communities and a just transition. And of course, I'm really excited to get the chance to um, moderate this panel and and um, from our, our conversations earlier, I'm surrounded by a lot of very smart, very dedicated people. So very excited to have and lead this conversation. So to get us all started, I'd love to ask a question um, and, and, and kind of catch you with an intro as well. So if our panel uh, members can, you know, open up about their um, background a little bit and then um, give us your initial thoughts after reviewing the fact book. We'll start with Ruhan. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ruhan Nagra. I um, co I co founded I founded rather and direct the Environmental Justice Clinic. Um, at the University of Utah Law School. Um, so just briefly, my, my background, um, my, my background is in law. I, I did graduate from law school, but my work has focused predominantly on community-based environmental justice advocacy. Um, so before moving to Utah a couple of years ago, I worked mostly in uh, Louisiana's Cancer Alley with historically Black uh, communities fighting uh, the petrochemical industry. Um, and then recently in, in Utah have been climbing a very steep learning curve, uh, very, very different context, very different types of communities here, um, but have been working on um, issues involving energy development, uranium mining and milling, and water rights um, since, since moving to Utah. Um, so I'll just jump right in and, and sort of respond to the question about um, re initial reactions to, to the findings of the fact book. Um, I'll make three quick points 
points. So, so one is um, I, I did find it interesting the the finding that you know both EJ members and EJ groups seem to favor um, citizen panels and public hearings as methods of community engagement. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, but I think as is often the case with community engagement, um, the successes of those methods would depend to a large degree on who from the community is involved, right? Um, and so I think. The, those of us who who work with with marginalized communities on any issue, and including environmental justice issues, know that um, there are sort of concentric circles of marginalization within communities. And so, um, are are the are the most marginalized people being intentionally targeted for participation and included in these processes? I think that's an important question. Um, are there or is it just sort of the most vocal or involved community members who are involved? Um, also, what's the process for sort of de uh, determining the composition of a citizen panel uh, or a public hearing, right? So um, if, if, for example, a project developer would have some kind of veto power over who's on a citizen panel, um, that might mean that a project developer would, would really try to um, uh, ex exclude people from the community who the project developer knows are vocally opposed to a project, for example, um, right? And so I think how we're determining who's on who's involved and who we're targeting for involvement are sort of the big, big questions that um, determine whether or not these these methods are successful. Um, another another sort of reaction that I had was, um, you know, I think one big impediment to community engagement is that um, project developers are often only interested in my experience um, in community engagement that begins from a baseline that's favorable to them. Um, so in other words, if community members are unequivocally opposed to a project, um, project developers are not interested in engaging with them, right? Um, and, and in a way that makes sense because project developers are often you know, for-profit corporations who have no a real incentive to engage with community members who don't see a path forward for the project, um, right? But what I think they, they often don't realize that the conversation is taking place on their terms. Um, community members are often really not setting the agenda of that conversation um, because the conversation is, if this project were to happen, how do we incorporate benefits to the community? Um, and that's a very different question from, should this project be happening in the first place? Um, and then finally, um, I would highlight, and I think this was echoed in, in some of the quotes that were pulled uh, from the survey too, is that information and resource asymmetry is, is a huge um, impediment, right? And so I think part of the reason that EJ groups felt that so much misinformation exists around hydrogen is because affected community members often don't have access to scientists um, who could who could sort of disprove misinformation that's coming from project developers. Um, for example, you know, oil and gas companies that are that are currently pushing hydrogen. Um, commu community members uh, don't have access to the same information as project developers. Um, and and they're rightfully suspicious of the technical or scientific information that a project developer is feeding them, right? So how do they wade through it and hear from independent scientists uh, about a project developer's claims? So I think community engagement processes have to enable the involvement of, of neutral third parties who can provide information that communities be, can, can place greater trust in. Um, I, I've also found, you know, project developers will cite various reasons, including market sensitivity, for example, to withhold information from community members. So in the hydrogen context, right, some, some communities members might say, um, how is this hydrogen going to be used? Because we, we think it should only, hydrogen should only be used in very, very specific circumstances, basically only when renewable and uh, when renewable electricity can't be used directly. Um, so I need to know how this hydrogen is going to be used before I can decide how I feel about it. Um, and project developers might say, you know, we don't know, we're still working it out, we're talking to the potential end users of the hydrogen, right? And those answers are not satisfying um, to community members because before people can authentically engage, they really need um, all the information. So I think this is something that project developers, really, in, in, in my experience working with communities, um, don't don't seem to understand. They don't they don't recognize or or sort of see the power imbalance um, that that's operating here. They seem to think that they're operating with engaging with communities on an equal footing, um, and 
so I think recognizing the the steep power imbalances that are at play um, is sort of the first step to then putting in place steps to to rectify or at least account for some of those imbalances. Thanks, Ron. I will pass it on to Beth. Hi, Marcel. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, I think Rohan said it uh, beautifully, so I'll just add um, that um, I am the research associate um, on this project. Um, so I've been working um, on this project for about a year now, um, and it's been, you know, a wonderful experience to see the, the diversity of perspectives that have really um, revealed themselves in the process. Um, I think uh, being that I like wrote and researched this uh, report, uh, it's probably easiest for me to speak to um, the the research uh, that presented itself. And so I think for me, it was the level of nuance that really was revealed um, as opposed to, um, you know, we, we were really building on our first um, report. And so our first report offered um, a, a jumping off point for us to continue this work and uh, continue to bring in a diversity of perspectives into the conversation. I think you know, as the hub process unfolds, um, we're seeing uh, that that things are, you know, shifting and changing. And the same is true for community members. Um, so making sure that our research is representative of that um, captures that nuance and um, and continues to work towards um, a, a more robust community engagement process is really important moving forward for us. Thanks, Beth. Um, and I'll pass it on now to Stephanie. Hi, thank you. Um, I will keep keep my comments brief, but I did want to just offer a little bit of uh, more background on um, where I'm, how I'm viewing this issue, right? So as Madeline mentioned, I'm a professor of sociology here at Colorado State, and I also co-direct the Center for Environmental Justice. And most of my work has been in um, community-based participatory research that is deeply community engaged, and that is in communities that have uranium production going on. I've been working on that since about 2005 in Utah, Ruhan. So maybe we need to connect at some point beyond this beyond this um, lovely event. Uh, and also unconventional oil and gas production, primarily um, the kinds of technologies that use vertical and horizontal drilling and um, the phase of production that we're very aware of, right? Called hydraulic fracturing. And I also am looking at communities that are building less capitalist, more distributive and regenerative systems, right? So working very much on the ground, looking at environmental justice and health impacts of living near extractive activities. Um, I'm working with uh, uh, several community organizations around Denver right now on the Suncor oil refinery, which is one of the biggest polluters in the state. And so I come at this from a perspective of what is procedural justice and procedural equity. And I, I think we'll get into that a little bit more um, down the road, but uh, what does it mean to actually have meaningful engagement and involvement, right? And so I don't want to be too long-winded here. I, a lot of what I observed in this report really echoes what Ruhan had said, um, just about what who is invited to the table, right? Who's constructing the table? And my work has, has shown me that unless EJ organizations or priority areas are involved in constructing the conversation and the table, that there is warranted skepticism um, from the beginning about just how meaningful and authentic their participation can be in discussing some of these issues. And I think that was a really important pattern that I saw across the data in terms of um, concerns about these technologies in general, but also the kinds of engagement that were preferred, right? They definitely lean in the direction of being as long-term and meaningfully involved as possible. But also I see some skepticism about whether or not even in those kinds of settings, right? Citizen panels and public hearings, whether or not folks opinions and voices and perspectives are actually then included in making decisions and in policy and planning, right? Um, and I think this is a really important part of what was captured here. And um, as we'll talk about, right, I think there are ways that communities can be engaged in even more meaningful ways and at the same level as developers who tend to be the ones that um, dominate conversations and construct the tables around which these discussions are had. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. And now we'll pass it on to Eleanor. Hi, um, my name is Eleanor Smith. I am a community organizer with Tuanajona Ene, which translates to Sacred Water Speaks in our Dine Navajo language. And I hail from the Navajo Reservation, Four Corners area. Um, we have historically been a um, marginalized 
<laughs> to say the least, uh, area um, for the fossil fuel industry. We've actually been a sacrifice zone for a, a, a whole century now um, for the fossil fuel industry, from coal to oil to gas to uranium to um, helium and now hydrogen development. And so, um, you know, we with TNA, we have taken the stand and, and we did participate in the survey um, and we uh, take the stand that we uh, oppose all forms of hydrogen um, based on the science. Um, and because we we believe that, you know, all forms of hydrogen, including green hydrogen, are really not clean um, when you consider, like, especially for our area, we, we are in an area where we are experiencing a mega drought and um, we just don't have the water to sustain green hydrogen development. Um, so, and then what is being proposed right now in for our reservation is um, blue hydrogen mixed with ammonia and to be piped into a pipeline to be constructed across our reservation coming in from the east of our reservation in New Mexico and going um, all the way across our reservation into Arizona and coming out um, in the west, uh, 200 plus mile long pipeline uh, to transport blue hydrogen and ammonia, which uh, scientists um, you know, have confirmed is a very um, dangerous explosive mixture. Um, and so that's just one of our concerns. Uh, we, we have been educating about hydrogen for well over three years now in our communities as soon as we got wind of this. Um, unfortunately, our Navajo leadership oppose or they highly um, seem to align with the hydrogen companies rather than their grassroots with us, you know, the, the local community members who have the majority of those have voted against uh, um, opposing, you know, we've opposed the hydrogen development and the pipeline. And so um, our tribal government, our Navajo Nation government um, seems to be more aligned with the hydrogen developers without taking into consideration our concerns and our stance. Um, so we continue to educate. Um, there are 13 communities that will be directly impacted by this hydrogen pipeline. And the majority of those communities have passed hydrogen opposition resolutions. And so we continue to educate. And I think um, one of the main uh, factors that the developers should be considering is language. Because we are on a Navajo reservation, a lot of our local government areas, which are called chapters, um, the people who attend the chapter meetings are elderly folks who only speak Navajo. And when the hydrogen developers came in, um, you know, at first they really didn't um, take that into consideration. They were doing all of their education, information, community engagement in English. And so when we started ours, we made sure that we accommodated for language. Um, I am, uh, I wouldn't say I'm fluent, but I can get by, but we have hired more fluent uh, Navajo speakers for to present um, to make our presentations, especially when you're talking scientific terms, it's very becomes very difficult. <laughs> and so we have to um, ensure that we have that language accommodation for our community members. Um, we going by the science, you know, um, there's an organization called uh, Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis, IEFA that states, contrary to the claims of blue hydrogen proponents, uh, the fuel is not clean or low carbon, and it never will be. And that producing blue hydrogen from natural gas is shown to have carbon intensities potentially as high as five times the DOE's clean standard. There's significant risk that the support and funding of blue hydrogen projects will make global warming worse because projects built in the coming years will continue to produce high carbon intensity blue hydrogen for decades. And neither the US 
federal government nor state government should fund dirty blue hydrogen projects. And that is IEFA's study conducted in 2023 titled Blue Hydrogen, Not Clean, Not Low Carbon, Not a Solution, Making Hydrogen from Natural Gas Makes No Sense. And so, you know, we present um, scientific findings like that when we do our community engagement education sessions. Um, and we focus on four areas, which is climate change, um, you know, and we interpret all of these things in Navajo. You know, we explain the process of what climate change is. Uh, we state our concerns about the water use for hydrogen production, uh, the lack of community engagement on the part of the uh, develop developers because they didn't start their community engagement until just about a year ago. Um, consultation, consent, um, and then pipeline safety and encroachment. So we focus our presentations on those areas. Um, and uh, we have the Sierra Club who takes our position as well that they do not support any uh, forms of, uh, well, for New Mexico, Rio Grande chapter. Uh, they don't support any of the um, uh, hydrogen projects that are being proposed. Um, and so, uh, and as well as, um, you know, like groups like No Fault Solutions out of New Mexico, who state that um, hydrogen is a, um, is not a solution for climate change. Thank you. Thanks so much, Eleanor. I really appreciate the the, the response and and I guess as well the additional perspective that you bring um, with, with your work and background. Um, so I'd like to stay with you. I, not sorry, you just muted, but um, I, you touched on this a, a little bit. Um, but I'd love to hear um, you go deeper on it. So, what steps do you believe that companies need to take to build trust with your communities and, and communities like yours, and ensure that they're genuinely addressing community concerns about hydrogen projects? Okay, I, I wish they would start with truth <laughs> because that's where trust begins. And um, we have had companies come in who have, um, you know, had presentations where they refuse to provide the um, language translator. Um, how can you educate a community if you don't speak their language? Um, and so, um, and then they're only presenting one side, you know, they, pre they present their pros um, how it's going to help the community, how much money it's going to bring to the Navajo Nation, um, you know, and that's their fo the focus of their presentation, but they don't um, focus on any of the cons, any of the scientific facts, um, and that's the perspective that we bring. We don't have a motivation for profit or for anything. We just are concerned about our communities. Um, we want what's best for our people, our future. Um, and that's why we um, focus on the science. We present um, what the companies have presented, you know, what they're saying. And also we present what the science is saying. And we leave it up to the communities to decide, you know, how they want to vote on the resolution. And all of them have chosen the opposition um, resolution. So, um, and, you know, we, and dealing with, um, okay, the companies are Greenview and Tallgrass, who are subsidiaries of um, Blackstone Energy. Um, they had applied for funding through the Hydrogen Hub, the $8 billion that you uh, spoke of earlier. Um, one is the Shine in Arizona and Nevada. The other one was the um, Western Interstate Hydrogen Hub, the WISH, and um, which you know, with was with the five states, um, New Mexico, Utah, um, Colorado, and Wyoming. And the other one, I believe, is Arizona and Nevada mainly. Um, but, you know, they applied for this funding uh, to develop these hydrogen hubs, uh, and they did not get selected by the DOE, um, I think mainly because we just don't have the water to support these hydrogen um, hub initiatives. And I'm so thankful to the DOE for taking that into consideration um, in not funding them. However, Blackstone being the multi-trillion dollar company it is, they said, oh, well, we're gonna move forward despite not receiving federal monies. And so they're still moving forward with a lot of their plans as is with um, the way they had planned to do these hydrogen hubs. 
And uh, the only thing is, see, now they don't have to, um, you know, um, submit to the requirements that the federal government has with community engagement with, um, you know, with the community benefits plan. Um, those are just kind of, um, the, they're just kind of um, coming out to our communities and they have done unethical practices like offering gift cards to community members going door to door telling them, okay, if you come to the chapter meeting and you vote for our resolution, then you will be given um, a gift card. And so they've been offered these. Uh, they've been going door to door to the grazing permit holders um, on our reservation. And a lot of these being elderly folks um, going to them and saying, you're going to be paid X amount of dollars, which really has not been a whole lot um, that they've been offered, um, considering that they want to use their lands for 70 years. Um, the other concern we have about these companies is that they are predominantly oil and gas um, pipeline companies. They've never built a hydrogen pipeline, much less a 200 mile long, which is, as far as we know, the longest hydrogen pipeline ever that's going to be ever built. Um, so um, they're basically the way I see it is um, they want to experiment on us. You know, we're going to be the guinea pigs to see if this is going to work. And so, um, you know, those are some of the concerns we have, and those are the, some of the concerns that we express. And in when we do our community engagement, our educational sessions, um, and then to be called out by the companies saying that we're spreading misinformation, we are uh, spreading lies, we're spreading fear. You know, we've heard all of these things from companies, the company on their radio ads on, you know, they, they play dirty basically. So, um, you know, we, we have to contend with all of that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ellen. I really appreciate your response. Um, and now I'll move on to, to Stephanie. Um, so, and, and this is linked to what a lot of what Ellen was talking about. So why does procedural justice matter in this context and, and, and what structural issues have affected communities' perceptions of the CPPs and their success? As we know earlier, um, Madeline touched on the fact that, you know, there's some, you know, distrust or, or or pessimism with regards to the CPP process. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, thank you for, for that question, Marcel. Um, so I think, first of all, just as kind of a definitional issue, right, so that we're all on the same page, procedural justice is a strand of environmental justice, right? When we think about environmental justice, we think a lot of distributive injustice. So where are the bad things and who's overexposed, who has access to the good things, um, and that's kind of a snapshot of what's going on. Procedural justice is much more so the set of processes and kind of the historical context around who's making decisions, how have these decisions been made, and importantly, not just participation, meaningful and authentic participation in making decisions, which means a two-way street of communication, right? But also access to information, information that is useful, right? That is translated for non-specialists, that is available in all relevant languages for any folks that are interested in participating in these processes. Doesn't matter how many of them there are, right? The multiple languages need to be um, present in situations where they're required. And procedural justice can be, it, it's really that background, right? In terms of how did we get where we are and how are we making the sets of permitting decisions or zoning decisions, et cetera, right? That that create the injustices that we that we are talking about. So procedural justice really matters, right? In turn, it's kind of the core of environmental justice, right? It's a key um, component of building trust. It's a key component of relationship building and reciprocity. And we really see that concern coming through, I would say, in, in many of the survey results, right? That even when there are community benefit plans, for example, folks are skeptical about how, or pessimistic, right, about how a beneficial does have actually been where you can have conversations going on. You might have meetings, workshops, et cetera. But what people seem to be saying, right, is especially EJ organizations, is that there's not a sense that that participation or those meetings lead to anything different or actually have a two-way street or will lead to community benefit plans that are actually um, 
deeply beneficial to the community, particularly in terms of community development and beyond the scope of economic development, which I'm not saying that's even well supported in community benefit plans, but often benefits focus solely on economic benefits, right? And not on intergenerational issues or other issues with community development, human well-being, human development, all those sorts of things, right? So procedural justice asks us to center some of those concerns, and that's why it's so vital to be well understood by folks facilitating these processes, and um, why I think it's so deeply important to EJ organizations. I think it also is important because procedural equity um, and those processes that get us there, they take a long time. And through that time, that's how we build relationships. We don't build relationships by dive bombing into communities and being there for a, a half a week or a week and saying that we've engaged with them, right? And I think part of the reason why procedural justice can be missing from community engagement processes, right, is, is both in what I've talked about in terms of who constructs the table, but then also in terms of what I've seen in my work and what you see across a lot of EJ research, right, is that and practice is that there's a precautionary principle or a precautionary sense that comes into conversations when there is room for these kind of participatory discussions. And often that precaution also takes time and it's not going to move at the pace that developers and industry would prefer. Of course, we have urgency because of the climate crisis, but that doesn't mean that we can be performative about community engagement or um, reproduce some of the same structural problems that occurred before. And so that leads me into kind of these political economic problems, right? Um, I think what I see in the data from this report, and this is also informed by work that I do, is that one of the big reservations here is that this smacks of business as usual, right? That this is yet another um, kind of neoliberal capitalist approach to um, green energy production that feels a little inauthentic. Whether or not it is, I think part of it is that it, it strikes people as being concerning because it may be reproducing some of those rather top-down, large-scale, extractive sorts of um, sources of energy production that we've seen in, in the context of oil and gas and coal and other sources of, of fossil fuels. And I think that's why there's such a stated concern, right, that this will just enhance fossil fuel dependence and will cause some very similar risks and harms to the places that might be located closest to these pipelines and or um, any facilities, right? So what I see coming through the data, right, is that this doesn't depart in, a, in terms of its structure or organization from what folks have seen kind of imposed upon them that have caused the environmental injustices that we've been talking about, right? And so um, if there were systems in place that were more distributive um, in terms of how benefits would actually be distributed within communities beyond just economics, but also including that, if uh, technologies were more regenerative or the ways in which people were being interacted with and the ways relationships were being built were more socially regenerative and long-term, I think we would see less of the skepticism emerge. And it's not just in this context, of course, it, it's when we look across communities and across um, technologies that are extractive that we tend to see these, these sorts of responses. Thanks, Stephanie. And I think now um, we are running out of time, so move on to the audience Q&A section. So I'll start off with a question for Beth and, and Madeline, um, pretty easy one. So what are the differences between EJ groups and EJ members in the fact book? Sure, um, I can speak to this briefly. Um, so uh, the differences are essentially based on two different surveys. So the uh, EJ members refers to um, our first survey, which you can find in our February release uh, fact book. So um, that is on our website if you want to refer back to that. So that's the first survey, and that is the EJ members survey. Um, so that survey actually looked at um, disadvantaged communities, tribal communities, um, labor uh, groups, and then also EJ members. So that's, um, we pulled out the subsection of EJ members to really dig into how they felt about these questions that we were asking. The EJ groups was sent to um, all groups that signed on to publicly facing hydrogen letters. 
Um, so that's that's the difference. There's, of course, a chance in which there could be overlap. Um, but because of differences in sample size, we don't really um, suspect that's the case. Um, and so um, here you're really seeing the, the distinctions between the EJ members survey and the EJ groups survey. I muted. There we go. Thanks, Beth. Um, and now we'll move on to a question for Ruhan. So um, I understand how a developer not knowing how and, and by whom hydrogen will be used creates distrust. But what if a developer really doesn't know yet? How would you recommend a developer proceed under that situation? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think part of the issue here, right, is that um, there's there's trust or there there are trust issues about whether or not the developer actually knows things or is just saying they know things, right? Because we we know that developers often say they don't they don't have certain information when they do, um, and so I think the the it. it so at a fundamental level, right, it goes back to really being transparent on issues that are known um, so that there's greater trust when issues are genuinely not known. Um, the other thing I would say, right, is that um, perhaps there could be mechanisms like if there if there are genuine concerns around disclosing certain types of information to community members, like there are things that can be done, like signing confidentiality agreements and and, and things like that, um, which certainly some EJ community members would be opposed to because there's a there's a, it, that's an impediment to organizing in communities, right? When you're not allowed to share information with fellow community members, so I'm so I'm not saying. Um, it's it's a perfect solution, but it might be one one step. Um, another thing, so so in to to go back to your specific question about if if project developers genuinely don't have answers about, for example, how hydrogen is used, right? Um, I think you know, having conversations with community members around different scenarios, right? So if hydrogen were being used under in for, for X or Y purposes, then how would you feel about it? And if it was used for, per, you know, purposes A and B, how would you feel about it? Creating different scenarios, maybe, and then engaging with communities on the basis of different scenarios. Um, I also found it intriguing in the fact book, how there, there was some mention of, um, by uh, binding agreements um and so you know perhaps when when information is not known right those kinds of things might be incorporated into a binding agreement where uh, approval or community buy-in is given on a conditional basis right we'll give you we, we're, we're okay with this as long as hydrogen is used in x or y ways and if it's not then we're not on board um right so those are just a few thoughts Thanks, Ron. And now we'll go on to Stephanie. So what advice would you give to groups that are interested in engaging and helping EJ groups without helicoptering in um, or just generally being excluded from conversations due to their positions on hydrogen? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. It really depends on what kind of group we're talking about, right? Like folks who are, if if we're talking about NGOs or university research groups, et cetera, I'll answer from the perspective of having done university-based research, right? That's that's community-based, um, meaning that often we are engaging with communities before we even know what the research project will look like because we want them to inform the questions that we're asking and have the research be as useful as possible. So one of the big elements here, right, is time, that it's not just it, to avoid being seen as helicoptering in, right? You really have to become part of the EJ community in the spaces that you're trying to learn from, right? Um, and so that means being a consistent presence, volunteering, right? Being around these spaces and genuinely understanding what is going on and how, how anything that you develop with them can be reciprocal, right? That you understand what communities want to learn from research and that you are building that into whatever you are working on, right? It also means, um, Connecting with folks when research or knowledge extraction isn't even the goal and doesn't even need to happen, right? It's building ongoing relationships so that when issues do emerge, those relationships already exist. And the, it's not so um, instrumental, right, in contacting folks or learning from folks in a very short time span and for like a finite um, goal, right? So I think it's the goal here, right, or, or the takeaway maybe to address this question is to get engaged as soon as possible in spaces where it seems relevant, um, but to do so in a way that comes from a place of genuinely wanting to learn from and 
um, build reciprocal relationships with the organizations and the people that you're interacting with. I think part of the problem is that often we're talking about extractive structures and industries, and then extractive means of interacting with other people and with other groups. And um, that's when walls go up, rightfully so, right? Because these groups have been extracted from and marginalized in multiple intersecting ways for long periods of time. So being aware of that and being as respectful as possible and being quiet and listening are really important ways to, um, to start to engage in a way that's meaningful and that won't come across as being, um, like I said, like using groups or being instrumental. Um, there's a lot more there, but I'll, I'll keep it at that to be brief. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. And now we'll bring it home with, with Madeline. Um, can you say a little bit more about the challenges to effective community engagement? Happy to. Um, I'll note that in our most recent survey that's out right now, we asked about some of the tangible things that community members have identified as being barriers like transportation, childcare, and some of those things that we kind of all have already heard about a lot. And then we asked about some of the more intangibles. And two of the things that rose to the very top of that list were trust and safety as being key priorities. And, um, you know, I think that there's we haven't yet dug into a lot of the specifics about what they are really picturing when they think about that. Um, but I think it's clear when case in point, look at our panel, which is overly representative of academics and slightly underrepresented on environmental justice organizations. And to be truthful, we had a hard time getting panelists to agree to be part of this event. And a lot of them expressed either a lack of capacity or just a, an ideological difference that wouldn't allow them to engage in the conversation. And, um, you know, that creates a lot of difficulties, of course, for trying to do effective engagement if there are ideological differences that really prevent people even from coming to the table. And I think trust and safety is part of that. And so hopefully when we get into a lot of those open-ended responses on the trust and safety particulars, we're going to have some really useful, actionable items that we can um, you know, suggest for people to start to actually build that trust um, and provide safety so that people can engage more effectively. Um, and I know that we are at time here, so I want to thank the panelists. And for those of you who submitted questions that we did not get to, we are going to follow up with each of you. So thank you for your questions. They will be answered. And with the panelists' permission, I will put you in touch if you had specific questions for the panelists um, so that those can be answered directly. And I'm going to hand it back to Dr. Moniz to see us out. Okay, well, thanks again, Madeline. And uh, really thanks to the panelists and, and our professional um, moderator uh, for um, what has been a very, very lively, uh, lively discussion. Uh, and uh, I, I, I won't try to summarize. I'll just uh, state that I think the... Um, uh, I think conversations like this uh, really help us understand how the clean energy transition and energy security and affordability and social equity really have to be one conversation and not uh, and not separate conversations. Uh, the uh, uh, I think there are strong synergies uh, among these, um, which gives some hope for uh, across the board progress while not hiding. Uh, the, some of the structural uh, uh, impediments, uh, for example, I think there, and, and I think the panelists have brought out, there can often be a tension, for example, between the transparency that communities need and the confidentiality uh, that uh, the commercial world will sometimes need. And so I think it's through conversation um, uh, and one conversation across the board that we can um, hopefully uh, make make progress uh, on all of this. We will keep our focus on uh, on all three of those areas, certainly including uh, the in, the environmental justice and uh, uh, social equity and and jobs and 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 community health, community organization that 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 is that is so important. So thank you again. Thank you to all of those who uh, who listened in. And um, as Madeline said, uh, we will endeavor to uh, have all the questions uh, answered uh, so that this conversation can go on. Thank you.